My name's Peter Shields and on behalf of AMET Scientific, I'm very pleased to welcome you all to today's webinar, Gas Monitoring at Landfills, Why, What and How. We're fortunate to have Charles Elkins, President of Elkins Earthworks in Ohio, to present on this topic. Well, thanks everybody for attending today. Uh, so, I am the owner of Elkins Earthworks and we do design and develop landfill gas monitoring equipment. Been in the industry uh, for about 15 to 20 years now, so hopefully some of my experience uh, will be beneficial to you. So the topic today is why do we monitor, what do we monitor, and how. Uh, just to get started here, I'd like to talk about a few of the American landfill statistics, which of course we have uh, a lot more of a population center over here than what there is in Australia. So some of these numbers are quite high. Americans generate about 250 million tons of garbage a year. Uh, there have been some reports that show that that number is a lot higher, almost twice as much. Since 1960, we've tripled the amount of waste that we generate. Only about a tenth of that is solid uh, garbage, and it, uh, only about a tenth of it gets recycled. I know Australia does a lot better at that, uh, so does the European Union, and hopefully the U.S. will uh, kind of move in that direction as well. Every day, the U.S. throws away enough trash to fill 63,000 garbage trucks. Of course, in the United States, that equates to a large number of landfills. We're almost at 3,100 landfills right now that are active and open. About 10,000 are old municipal waste landfills that are closed, uh, and that's according to the U.S. EPA. I know in Australia, the numbers are a little bit more difficult to uh, gather. Uh, with talking to the Victoria EPA, uh, Nick Simmons, sounds like they're still trying to count all the open and closed landfills that you're dealing with. So let's talk about the process over, overview. What is a landfill? Some of you probably are well versed in what landfills are, but for those of you who aren't, I'll spend about five minutes just talking about how landfill is constructed so we know what we're doing with the landfill gas monitor. So there's three basic types of landfills. You have your hazardous, sanitary, and open dumps. As you can see there in the picture with the BOMAG compaction in a current active facility with the liner going down the back. The anatomy of landfill is quite different these days than what they were probably about 30 years ago. Today we have a compacted subliner, a subliner like a clay, plastic, aggregate on top of that for leachate drainage. Some landfills have textile mats, granular drainage, soil layers, but even more important what we see here is that the way that the waste is placed within the landfill. As you can see up here on top by my pointer there's a uh, compactor packing waste into the landfill. And as you can see there's dirt in certain layers and basically it's placed when the landfill closes at the end of the day for alternative daily cover or cover to keep birds, varmints, odors down and whatnot. But as you can see, these are kind of uh, put in in uh, dry tombs is what they used to call them uh, a few years ago. It's important for these landfills to strip this daily cover so they can key the new trash into the old trash so that when it comes time to extract the gases or to let the, the methane uh, come up or let the leachate go down uh, within the landfill, that we're not having to, to go through different soil layers. Just uh, for reference here, here is a, a liner system, brand new going into a landfill, where on the left you have a, a old cell with a fluff layer with some soil cover on top of it. So just kind of a nice picture for you guys to see. I think this was here in uh, Ohio about two or three years ago. The older landfills, of course, here in the States, they started closing the landfills that are not constructed like the one that you just saw probably back in the early 90s, late 80s. Most of those don't really have a compacted clay soil liner. Uh, they definitely don't have the plastic protective liners. Most do not have leachate collection systems. If they do, they were put in afterwards with just drilling down through the waste and putting pumps in. And then most of them also do not have gas collection systems. I know in Australia right now they're still trying to get a handle on all the closed landfills, trying to find out where they're at, and try and do some of the corrective actions that we'll talk about later on. Why the change in landfill design? Well, over the past 30 years, the world's become more concerned about what happens to the waste that's buried in the landfills. Accidents such as exploding homes or landfills, near landfills have drawn attention to landfills. We have one specific facility here not too far from me where two or three homes 
exploded due to landfill gas migration uh, through the soils. Also, there's cases of contaminated groundwater near landfills from leachate seeping from the bottom of the old cells. So in conclusion, it's the byproducts of the waste that's driven the industry to a better design and a better practice of landfilling. What are the byproducts of landfilling? Well, there's two basic byproducts. Of course, we have the gases, which uh, everybody always talks about methane, but there are other gases involved as well. And then down here on the bottom left in the picture, you can see this big uh, black pond of liquid. Uh, at this facility, that's a leachate aeration pond. So all this leachate that comes out of the landfill here is basically water that has either been placed with the waste or rainwater or drainage that's gone through the waste. So those are basic two products of a landfill. So why do we monitor landfills? Getting into the, the why question here. Well, let's focus on the landfill gas. That's what we're here to talk about today. Leachate uh, can be covered at some other point. So how does landfill gas move? Well, we got two vectors that we're dealing with. We have the air vector, which basically means the landfill gas is coming through the surface of the landfill, through the waste, through the cover systems, going out to the ambient air. The other, the other vector that we have is called a soil vector. So that's when our leachate or our, our methane actually progresses out of the landfill through the surface strata, say through sands, silty sands, gravels, just through strata at the bottom of the landfill. So why do we monitor landfill gas? These are the big questions. There's got to be a reason why we go through, through this expense. Well, number one is because it's a liability. Regulations from the EPA, such as the Victoria EPA, which pretty much leads the landfill gas regulations in Australia, uh, has certain guidelines and laws to protect the environment and to protect people around the landfill. There are fines for noncompliance, so that's a big driver, of course, but also uh, we want to prevent migration. It's a health and safety issue. Uh, explosive gases, uh, methane is explosive. We'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Uh, you have cases such as the Cranbourne landfill, city of Casey, uh, just south of Melbourne. Uh, and then you have cases like Hardy Road here in the USA, as well as a few other facilities up in northern Michigan where houses have uh, sustained uh, substantial damage from methane migration. Also, we want to look at preventing odors coming through that air vector we were talking about earlier as well. Uh, nuisance odors, uh, they can cause legal action. Here in the United States, a few facilities near me here as well uh, have what are called notice of violations, which cover heavy fines and uh, also can be a, a financial liability as well. Another reason is because the health and safety of the landfill is important. We need to monitor landfill gas to basically measure the state of decomposition within the landfill, uh, monitor the health and safety of the bacteria, and then also to, present so, to prevent subsurface fires and to keep uh, the decomposition of the waste stable. You can see down here, here's the basic uh, combustion reaction within a landfill. And then over here on the right side, of course, you can see a quite nasty picture of a subsurface fire that's going on in a landfill down in Kentucky. Another reason why is because it has economic benefits, uh, energy development potential, high BTU, medium BTU products, projects, uh, such as engine fuel, Caterpillar engines, Deutz are to name a few. Also with turbines, which of course you can see in the picture right down here on the bottom right, this is a turbine plant. Uh, boiler fuel, uh, basically compressing the landfill gas into a pipeline going to a facility that may produce cars, maybe uses uh, non-contact process steam. Also pipeline quality fuel, going from a medium BTU to stripping the CO2 in, a, in the gas, which produces about 99.8% methane and, and goes right into the pipeline. Here in the United States, there's quite a few CNG projects that are coming up through a company called Cornerstone, and a lot of landfill facilities are actually compressing the, the natural gas, what we're calling CNG there, and uh, putting it into the uh, equipment used on the site or into uh, trash moving equipment. So let's talk about landfill gas, the basics. So we'll go down to the molecular level. We're talking about carbon attached to four hydrogen molecules, uh, CH4. So we're going to cover the characteristics of landfill gas, landfill gas generation, and landfill gas composition. The basic definition of landfill gas is the gaseous byproduct of the decomposition of organic materials in a sanitary landfill under anaerobic conditions. So there are two things that you hear from us. One is called anaerobic and the other is called aerobic. So anaerobic means lack of oxygen. 
The conditions required for landfill gas uh, can contain a number of different items. Organic materials, of course, we're not talking about concrete debris, glass, plastics, rubbers. Uh, that does us no good in generating landfill gas. What we're looking for is more of those products that uh, carbon-based. We're talking about uh, household waste, food waste, yard waste, stuff like that is really good for generating landfill gas. We also need moisture. Without moisture, the bacteria just can't survive. Some of those nutrients that we find in the food waste and the other wastes uh, are good for landfill gas generation. We're also dealing with anaerobic conditions. Uh, landfill gas is not produced in aerobic conditions. So we're looking at that anaerobic bacteria as well. The major constituents of landfill gas that everybody talk about are the major gases. Methane, which is CH4, carbon dioxide, which is CO2, nitrogen, N2, oxygen, O2, and of course we have trace gases in there and quite a bit of moisture in landfill gas. So here are the basic compositions of landfill gas. Looking at the methane, basically you can see between 45 and 58 percent methane. This is of course depending on what kind of region you're in, whether you're in an arid region or non-arid region. Carbon dioxide, 5 to 45 percent. Oxygen, really less than 1 percent would be optimal. Nitrogen the same. Hydrogen you do see in landfills. Uh, it occurs naturally, and we'll look at that on the uh, gas generation curve here in a minute. You do have water vapor that comes up in the landfill gas. I've actually seen water vapor as high as 15% uh, myself. Trace constituents, um, other gases such as hydrogen sulfide. Uh, there are some parts per million in um, CO naturally occurring and then some other volatiles as well that will fall in there. So looking at landfill gas generation, there are definitely different phases. We'll get a little bit more into these in a few minutes, but early decomposition, you have your mature steady state decline, and they're also measured upon rates. How much uh, a cubic foot of gas can be produced uh, per pound for the life of the pound of waste, or for the lifetime, uh, for annual or for lifetime. So what are the factors that influence landfill gas? Refuse quantity. Of course, you're going to generate more landfill gas if you're doing 10,000 tons a day versus 100 tons a day. The composition plays a big role. Uh, are you taking in concrete, construction, demolition debris, or are you taking in a lot of municipal mm -hmm. solid waste? That definitely plays a part. The compaction plays a part too. How dense is the waste when it's being packed in the landfill? Refuse age, of course, if your uh, age waste uh, is probably 30 years, you're not going to generate as much uh, landfill gas as you do when the waste is three years old. And you'll see that in the curve I'll show you in a few minutes. And once again, I can't stress more than enough is moisture content. Uh, there are landfills over in Perth that I've been to that do not generate as much landfill gas as those over in Brisbane or down in Melbourne. Factors influencing landfill gas continued. pH and alkalinity is a big one. Just like you and I, we like for things to be neutral. Landfill gas, the methanogens, if you get a real low pH or a high pH, uh, those bugs will actually stall. Uh, they produce more hydrogen. They may be stuck in a different phase of their life. So pH and alkalinity of your leachate and of your waste mass plays a big effect. So do the toxics. Having a lot of things in your landfill like gypsum board, uh, drywall as some people call it, can produce a lot of hydrogen sulfide. That hydrogen sulfide is toxic to the landfill. As well as things like uh, aluminum salt cakes produces a lot of ammonia. It's very toxic to the landfill. Uh, temperatures. Perth you know, the temperatures over there are usually pretty warm, at least warmer than over in Melbourne. That temperature does affect uh, your landfill gas. Some things that people talk about with enhancement, I don't see a whole lot of this except for the leachate recycling. So recycling the liquids that come out of the bottom of the landfill, taking them back up to the tipping face, moistening the waste as it goes into the landfill really helps with landfill gas generation. Sludge addition, uh, some places around here uh, take 20 to 30 percent sludge in the landfills. That also helps, but that can also hinder landfill gas extraction as well. Some of the characteristics of landfill that are important. Uh, I believe everybody knows that methane is combustible. It's an explosive gas. Landfill gas is uh, pretty much for, for just 
talking, say, 50% methane. The lower explosive limit of methane is 5%. As we were talking about earlier, the methane that goes through the soil vector into the houses, you only need 5% in the basement of a surrounding structure when a furnace kicks off and turns on for there to be an explosion. Uh, the upper, upper explosive limit is about 15% methane. So if we look at things in comparison, the natural gas that's in the pipelines outside of everybody's home is about 1,000 BTUs per cubic foot. So natural gas is primarily methane. So if we look at 50% methane, we're looking at about 500 BTUs per cubic foot. Just something to kind of put it in reference there, what, uh, what the values and heating values and some of the characteristics of landfill gas is. So phases of decomposition, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but as waste gets compacted into the landfill, you're compacting air with that uh, BOMAG compactor you saw earlier. So as well as waste is packed into the landfill, you're packing air in with it. So we have conditions that are called aerobic, air meaning air, the air that we breathe. There are certain bacteria that uh, thrive in aerobic conditions that consume the oxygen, and that's how the waste composition decomposition starts. Then we have the flocculative acid forming stages, early methanogenic, and we step into steady and then mature. And I've got a graph here that will show that to you. So here's a graph. This is one that uh, everybody in the industry is used to seeing. It's a very good tool, especially when you're teaching new people uh, what goes on with landfill gas. Okay, this one's kind of messy, so I'm just going to talk about the phases on this one, and then we'll move to another one that's a little bit clearer for you. But I want to show you there's basically five phases with landfill gas generation. First phase is when you're in aerobic conditions, when you're packing the waste in. Second phase can last one to six months. Sometimes it can be even longer than that. None of these phases here really abide 100% by these time frames that are listed below. But I wanted to show you that usually this uh, graph here trends from left to right uh, as far as waste age goes. You get over to the age uh, over in uh, phase five, you're talking 10 to 80 plus years. And as you can see, after you get 10 years of waste age, your methane carbon dioxide start to drop off. So it starts to drop off. So I'll go ahead and pop onto the next screen here. This one's a little bit clearer for you. So it takes off all the other lines. But what I want to show you here is in the aerobic phase, once again, the air that we breathe is about 80% nitrogen. So here's our nitrogen line, this dotted line here. Here's our oxygen line. So you can see the, the aerobic bacteria consumes the oxygen. And by the way, nothing consumes nitrogen. Nitrogen is an inert gas. There are no bacteria that really consume the nitrogen. So then as you see, what happens is our hydrogen starts to pick up. So hydrogen can get up to 20%. And I've actually seen it in landfills right now that I'm working on that have 20 to maybe even 30% hydrogen. Carbon dioxide starts to pick up. And I've actually seen this phase on a landfill gas analyzer with a new well in waste that's only about six months, seven months old. What you'll see is the carbon dioxide starts to drop, the methane picks up. This is when the anaerobic bacteria starts working on the waste mass. And there's a critical point here that I want to show you where this dashed line here crosses this solid line here. This is where your methane percent finally climbs higher than your carbon dioxide percent. This is a very critical point. This is stable here. This is what you want to see. Something to note, and we'll also point it out later on in this talk, is that not only can we go to the right in direction and time, but if, if you stress the landfill and have certain conditions or maybe your waste mass has changed, it will actually go backwards. And this is a very critical point right here that we'll talk about in just a few minutes. So gas generation over time. You can see what we talked about earlier is all these phases, but basically gas generation starts when the first pound of waste is put into the landfill. Continues to climb until the date that the landfill closes. And then you can see how that, uh, you know, 10 to 80 years of landfill gas production just kind of tails out over a long period of time. These curves are really used when people are trying to determine whether to put in a landfill gas to energy project, what kind of capital to put out at what times, and also it's used as a tool to, to kind of look at, well, am I extracting as much 
as what the gas curve said I should extract. So it's a tool for a number of different reasons. So now that we know a little bit more about landfill gas and how it's produced, let's talk about how we measure it. So what gases do we want to measure? Well, from the previous slide, you can see that there's really four basic gases that we want to measure. Everything else is, uh, you know, not so prevalent in our gas stream. So we're looking at methane, CH4, carbon dioxide, oxygen. Now, balanced gases, it's listed as a balanced gas because with the field instrumentation that we use, uh, whether it be an Envision, a a gem meter, a gas data machine, what you're going to see is you're going to see that it's listed as balanced gas. Balanced gas basically is nitrogen for the most part with all the other trace gases that you see. So what we do is we take 100 percent, we minus the methane percent, minus carbon dioxide, minus oxygen, and we get our balanced gas. So what are the ways that we analyze landfill gas? Well there's a number of different ways. Uh, gas chromatograph, those used to really be used years ago. They're accurate. It's a laboratory-grade instrument. They're very finicky. Uh, the user has to be well-trained on the machine. It's not really built for outside use. Plus, it costs about $30,000 USD. So it's not really something you want to lug around. Uh, plus, they're quite bulky. Uh, they're heavy. You need to put it on a piece of equipment or in a truck to carry it around. So the conclusion is it's an option but it's not really a good one, especially if you're out there monitoring 10, 20, 100, 200 wells. Uh, it's not something that's really adapted for the well field. Some people ask about flame ionization detectors. Well, FIDs, uh, they're in the parts per million range, 0 to 50,000 parts per million to be specific, which is about 0 to 5% methane. It's really meant for reading volatiles in ambient air, doing a surface sweep of the landfill to see if you have any emissions coming out of the surface. So really it's good for sniffing leaks on pipes, uh, looking for uh, landfill gas coming out of the surface of the landfill, but it's not really a good instrument to tote around and to take gas readings with. The next type of instrument we have is an NDIR, which is non-dispersive infrared. The accuracy of those units are 2 to 3%. They're really easy to calibrate. They're pretty robust these days. So they're inexpensive as well compared to other methods, the FIDs, the gas chromatographs. Plus the way that NDIR cells are built these, these days, you can easily assemble them into a package with other types of sensors and put it in a really nice sized field unit. So the other thing we want to talk about is the galvanic cells for O2 measurement. Gas chromatograph will do oxygen, but really to do an O2 measurement in the field, uh, we're looking at a galvanic cell. Uh, galvanic cells are accurate. They're easy to calibrate. Once again, they're robust, and they're pretty inexpensive. One of the only downfalls to a galvanic O2 cell is that they are consumable. It does have an electrolyte in it uh, with lead sometimes. And they do consume, so they are something that you'll have to replace uh, pretty much every year. So our preferred method in DIR with a galvanic cell, once again, the non-dispersive infrared will do methane and CO2. And that's an infrared lamp source with a sample chamber and a wavelength optical chamber. So just to look at things here, I won't read through all this text. I won't bore you with that. But what we're looking at here is we're actually looking at, at an example of a NDIR sensor. You have an IR lamp on one end, one end with gas coming through. Basically, the light goes through and is absorbed by certain molecules, whatever you are uh, looking to measure. And you have a reference and a detector signal or a filter on the other end. And basically, by the absorption of those light waves and using the filters, it will tell you the percentage of gas that you have coming through the cylinder. Galvanic cells, a pretty easy concept. You have a gas that contains oxygen coming through the end of the cell, hitting the cathode. With the electrolyte and the lead anode, basically you have a reaction. And that reaction is captured uh, through a load resistor, which with the programming and printed circuit boards that come with them or within your instrument itself, it measures that resistance and changes it into an actual O2 percentage. 
So that's why these things need to be calibrated uh, pretty much on a daily basis, maybe several times a day throughout the course of measuring landfill gas. Uh, so what else do we need to measure uh, with landfills? And we've talked about the gases, so let's look at the pressures. Uh, we need to measure pressures. Pressures give the field technician an idea of what they're looking at. The gas is only one key to the puzzle, or one, one piece to the puzzle. You know, we want to know how much pressure we have applied to the actual well. How much do we have available uh, for extraction of the landfill gas? And what pressures do we have across the flow device to actually calculate how much flow we have coming through that wellhead? It's great if we have 60% methane, but if we have no flow, we're not really extracting anything and we're not getting anywhere. So without pressures, uh, we only have one piece of the puzzle. We also want to know temperatures. Temperatures of the landfill gas will actually tell us a lot. The temperature, how is it trending over time? We can use a wired uh, Bluetooth or we can use a dial thermometer. But basically the temperature will actually tell us do we have thermophilic action going on in the landfill? How's the bacteria behaving? Uh, do we have some kind of subsurface oxidation happening? So temperatures are a very good thing to take. So let's kind of look at the field instrument. We talked about what we use um, as far as technology goes. What you're looking at here is an instrument that we produce. Basically, the Envision here is a two-part system. We have the Envision in the background here, which basically I call the brawn. And why I call it that is because it houses the NDIR cells, methane, CO2, also has the galvanic oxygen cell in it. And as you can see on the front here, there are several ports for hoses uh, for pressure readings. So everything, all the mechanics are all done in this unit here, but it's Bluetooth connected to a handheld unit. This handheld unit here displays to the user all the gas qualities, has all the functionality in it for compensating for cross-contamination, converts all the signals, stores all the data. So really, this is a two-part unit reason why we did that on here is because, as we've all seen in the past, non-dispersive infrared technology, galvanic cells, they really haven't changed much in the past 10, 20 years. Yeah, sure, there's been some upgrades to it, a little bit better uh, uh, quality-wise, but really that doesn't change much. What changes these days, of course, is the processing power, what we can do with the new technology that's coming out with the handhelds. So you can just see see here an example of the basic packages that, that you might find on the market. So now we get into the well field. So what does a wellhead setup look like? So here's a technician from overhead. Basically we have the system vacuum coming through a lateral over here. This is delivered from our blowers. Hose connecting to the wellhead. You can see a, a fine tuning throttle valve here. Here's our Bluetooth thermistor on the side. Hose is connecting from the backpack of that Envision that you saw in the previous picture up to the well so we can take the analysis and take the pressures. And then another tablet here which is what the user uses to actually see what's going on. Just another picture of another company, that's American Environmental Group over here in the United States, connected up to a different wellhead. As you can see the hoses, there's three different hoses that connect here. So just another example for you. This is just a cutaway of a wellhead that we find here in the United States. This is called the Venturi style. Uh, once again, you'd like to have a wellhead that has a flow device, which is right in here. Uh, static and differential hoses connect here and an available hose there. So let's perform the analysis. So just wanted to make a quick note here. Um, well field tuning is an art. Um, it takes several years of experience to understand what is actually going on within a landfill. Uh, one of the things to remember that a landfill is actually a, leave, a living, breathing, bioreact. There are actually living organisms in there that's actually generating this methane. It gets down to even to where different wells in different areas will behave differently. You may see a difference in waste between one well and another. One produces great, one produces poorly. So there's no one situation uh, that fits any scenario. So what I'm just going to talk about uh, from here on out is just some examples things so I don't think that you can apply everything that I say uh, in the next five or ten minutes to everything that goes on in a landfill. So the analysis, so this is the typical screen that you'll see uh, when you do a, a landfill well analysis. Uh, once again we're looking at methane, carbon dioxide, oxygen, balance gas. 
Neat thing with this instrument here is you turn the pump on, you just click a button, it's on the touch screen. These numbers start to change and you'll see that there are colors here. These colors change according to what you have programmed in the instrument. If you want to see methane between 50 and 52 percent, you can program that in and these colors will change green if it's within that range. We also have well temperature down here that you can dial in uh, with your fingers or you can connect up to Bluetooth. And then also the ratios. This is something different that only the Envision has actually on its screen and, and the reason why is this is built upon 20 years of well field experience. These ratios actually mean something and mean something when the well field technician standing at the well tuning can help with educated decisions and we'll go over those ratios now. So the response time of this instrument of NDIR cells of course depends on how much hose you have hanging out there. Uh, also how much vacuum you're pulling against in the vacuum system. We usually see between about 30 to 90 seconds of a time before the, the readings stabilize. The nice thing about the Envision is that when the readings do stabilize, these blocks here turn green. On the ratios, we have our balanced gas to O2, CH4 to CO2, and once again, these ratios are good to see on real time. What do these ratios mean? Well, let's go over the balanced gas to O2 ratio. The air that we breathe is 79.1% nitrogen, 20.9% oxygen. So that's a ratio of 3.78. Um, if that ratio is 3.78 on your screen, right here, that turns a certain color. But it's right in front of you so you can see that. What the technician should be doing there at that time is looking for any kind of air leak that is near the sample port itself or in the wellhead. Gas travels in the path of least resistance. So if there's a leak in an, an O-ring, a leak, uh, let's say, uh, in the thread on the tape, a broken hose or something, you're going to see that 3.78 ratio. The reason for that is, like I said before, nitrogen is an inert gas. Nothing within the landfill consumes that nitrogen. So the aerobic bacteria within the landfill, that's only dormant, aerobic bacteria, a bacteria does not die off. It basically goes to sleep. It goes dormant. But as soon as it starts getting ambient air in, it wakes up and starts consuming the oxygen and leaving the nitrogen. So the further that ambient air goes through a waste mass, the more oxygen is consumed, leaving more nitrogen. So your ratio gets higher. So here's just an example. That's a quick sketch I did of a well in a landfill. Here's a coupler. There's a leak in the coupler leaking ambient air. If you look at your results on your analyzer, you're going to see ambient air. The ratio is 3.78. You get just a little bit further away from the well and that ratio goes up. If it's between 3.78 and the teens, you should be looking for not only you know, O-rings and hose issues and filters and sample ports, stuff like that, but start looking on the ground. Do you have cracks on the ground? Is your well bore seal dried up? Really, there's not much waste consumption of that ambient air. So here's the ambient air going through just a little bit of waste mass, blending with the other landfill gas that's down below, and you can see you've got a ratio of about five. So if that ratio is in the upper teens or higher, what are we looking at? We're looking at cover integrity issues further away, erosion reels, exposed waste, uh, maybe even overdrawing the landfill. We're just pulling too much. So we're pulling more gas than what the bacteria wants to give us. It leads to high ratios. It actually could be damaging to the landfill causing subsurface oxidation if there's a lot of oxygen being consumed. So here's another example of ambient air traveling through a waste mass a little bit further away. The aerobic bacteria is consuming 18%, 5% O2, 1% O2 as it gets closer to the well. Therefore, you see the higher ratio. This is basic. But a lot of landfill gas technicians don't really look at this ratio, and it's very important to what they do. Let's move on to methane to CO2 ratio. It's also displayed on the screen right down here. CH4 to CO2 ratio is really critical to the health of the landfill. We went over that a little bit earlier when you looked at the gas generation curve. If that value is one or higher, you're great. Your meth basically what that says is your methane percent is higher than your CO2 percent. We want to see it that way. If those ratios are 
lower, what we're doing is we're kind of going back on that curve. We talked about this a little bit earlier. This is where we want to be over here, where methane is actually higher than our carbon dioxide. If we go back this way, we're kind of getting close back to the aerobic bacteria stage, and that's not so good for the health of the landfill. And you'll see that more in readings like 24% methane, 29% CO2. You could be seeing fresh waste that you've put in, but it could also be a, a response to overdraw. Landfills like such uh, over in Perth, I've been to a few of them. They do have really low uh, gas qualities, but still even then they should be shooting for a higher methane percent than carbon dioxide percent. So what do the technicians do? If our value is under one, they're going to try and cut that throttle valve back and start extracting less gas. If it's higher than one, then they're just going to tune for whatever goal the landfill is set for methane percent. Just to look for, you know, some of the other things like I was talking about before, why do we see that change going down lower methane percentages than CO2 percentages? I've actually seen it uh, because of a change in waste characteristics, bringing in aluminum salt cakes, lots of drywall that can really affect why those readings go that way. And what we want to do is, if that ever does happen, we want to look and evaluate and see what's happened to the waste mass health. Have the temperatures increased? Uh, that's a bad thing. Um, what's the balanced gas to O2 ratio? Let's take some carbon monoxide levels to make sure we don't have any subsurface oxidation going on. And let's make the adjustments based on the findings. So our last topic, we're going to talk about pressures real quick. Uh, we already looked at the instrument and you could see that on the front of the instrument you had your pressure ports. We're looking at what a pressure we have applied to the well. Sometimes that's called static pressure. We're looking at differential pressures. What's the difference in pressure across our flow device that will help give us the flow itself? The Envision has three ports. It has an applied pressure, differential pressure, and also an available pressure so we can see what vacuum in the header we have to use for adjustments. So once again, here's the front of the Envision. You can see basically how this is hooked up to a landfill gas well. Impact, static, and available. And of course you have your exhaust. The gas that goes through the instrument has to exhaust somewhere. Applied pressure, talked about these basically. I kind of got ahead of myself here a little bit. But you'll see different terminology. Some people call it applied static. Some called differential impact, some call available pressure. But really, we need to see all these pressures to understand what adjustments the technician's going to make in the well field. Back in the good old days, technicians used to carry around a separate set of pressure gauges as well as their MSA with, with methane and something to measure the O2. So it's really become a, a good compact unit these days. With pressures, what do we do with them? We're looking at flow to see what we're going to have coming across and out of the, uh, out of the landfill gas collector itself. Uh, that's going to tell us what our methane qualities actually mean, whether we're flowing or just setting stagnant. What effort we need to collect from that gas collector. And also, what else do we have going on in the main header system? Looking at that available vacuum can tell us whether we have a main pressure drop, uh, in our header system that we need to look at. Do we have any kind of condensate collection system that's not pumping any longer? Do we have bellies forming in the pipe? And that's seen by a pressure surge going back and forth from a negative to a positive, going back and forth like this. So all the pressures actually mean something. We're not just taking them to just record another point. And so you can see that here on the screen, static, differential, uh, calculated flow and then a system pressure. And these, on the Envision, you can lock these, you can unlock them, but they keep moving back and forth so you can kind of see that, uh, that surging if you need to see it. Once the technician gets done with these readings, they just hit a button and it stores it into a .csv file that you can put into any database. The land tech units or geotech units that you have, they do the same thing uh, pretty much in a .csv file. Uh, something unique to our instrument, and this was basically built this way for Australia, along with talking to uh, Cranbourne, talking to the Victoria EPA, is a borehole pressure. There are other instruments out there that do this, but in our instrument, you can actually use it as a landfill analyzer looking at the gas extraction system and also use the same instrument to do your borehole probes. 
took a lot of mechanical engineering for the internals to be able to do two instruments worth of work in one instrument and it also has the logging features and barometric pressures so you can see that screen down here and like I said uh, we have some clients there in, in the Melbourne area that really helped us kind of tweak this uh, feature of, of our instrument. So one of my last slides here, just talk about meter advancements. Over the past 10 years, we've seen GPS come into play, barcoding. GPS is a good one, not only for finding your well location, marking your well locations, but also for data validation and, and actually knowing that your technician went to the correct point and you can actually validate his data that he was at where he was supposed to be. Within our instruments, we have Wi-Fi cellular connectivity, processor speeds, tablet technology. That's all increasing every year, uh, so why not take advantage of it? Programming. Uh, instruments, instruments now can do so much more than what they did five years ago. And also, the accuracy is a lot better. Uh, finding better ways to uh, take out the effects across contamination, what pressures and what temperature does to your NDIR cells or oxygen cells. Uh, with programming these days, it can get pretty accurate. So there's just so many topics to cover in such little time. Usually what we do is uh, we teach a technician how to use an instrument. We can teach somebody how to use an instrument and get really comfortable with it in a matter of hours. Uh, but typically, um, we like for technicians to be in the well field for a few months, then come in and actually do training like this. Basically, I've tried to cram about three to four days worth of training into a 45-minute session which is really hard to do. So there's so many other topics out there, subsurface fires, what to look at in, in vacuums and readings, the troubleshooting. There's so much out there, but can't cover it all in 45 minutes. So I'd like to say thanks to AirMet. Thanks for inviting us. Thanks for making me put together this nice PowerPoint that hopefully can live forever on YouTube. I'd like to thank the Victoria EPA, Nick Simmons. You gave us a lot of input on tweaking some things for Victoria and borehole flows and also like to thank Run, Run Energy for helping us get into Australia. Um, they use our instrumentation. Also to the city of Casey, uh, Paul, uh, he selected our analyzer to use down at the city of Casey, Cranbourne Landfill. There's some links here that you'll see. So thanks for your time. Thanks very much, Charles.